Our ability to reach unity and diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. That is a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. Welcome to Trina Talk. This is the podcast where guests share their stories of pursuing their passions, living a fulfilled life, and empowering others. Each week, I talk with inspiring leaders, business owners, and people with amazing stories from around the world in unscripted conversations as they share their successes and failures. This podcast is all about empowering you to keep striving in your personal and professional life. I am your host, Trina L. Martin. Welcome to episode 124. Before I get into this week's episode, I'm excited to share with you that I have been selected as one of the international speakers for Sean Fair's Leadership Experience Tour 2021. It's happening April 10th in Troy, Michigan. I will be on the stage empowering you to be resilient, regardless of what has happened in your life. I invite you to purchase your virtual ticket at bit.ly forward slash L-E-T 2021. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be life changing. Now on to the show. The topic of this week's episode is diversity, inclusion, and purpose. My guest this week is Kong Shang. Kong is an experienced human resources, and management consultant. He has worked at some of the world's top leadership development companies where he successfully helped his clients drive superior performance by developing their leaders and aligning their people, structure, and process. Kong offers creative insight and inclusive solutions to tackle some of human resources' biggest challenges, such as diversity, equity, and inclusion, employee engagement, strategic execution, cultural transformation, and organizational effectiveness. Kong is also the host of the Purpose Tune podcast. Welcome, Kong, to Trina Talk. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to your uh, amazing show. I'm glad to have you here. We talked last week on your show and it was amazing. And I'm so happy that we can continue this conversation and and just delve right into some other things. But before we get started, tell the listeners who you are and how you come to be the Kong that you are today. Yeah. So, I mean, should we go with the professional route or the personal route in terms of explaining Whatever you want to do. If you want to do a blend, that's fine. <laughs> so I, I, let's start with my professional background, then we could tie into um, a little bit more on my personal side. Um, so I have 10 plus years of experiences in um, in HR and management consulting. Um, I've worked with uh, some of the top leadership development companies um, to successfully help my clients drive superb performance by developing their leaders and aligning their talent, their, their structure and processes. Um, throughout my career, I've offered creative insights and um, leadership solutions to tackle some of the biggest challenges that human resources face around employee engagement, strategy execution, cultural transformation, diversity and inclusion, and organizational development. Um, I come from a family of 12 kids. Um, my parents are Hmong, which is spelled K-H, I'm sorry, it's H-M-O-N-G. That's my background. Hmong people are an ethnic uh, group of people from the highlands of Laos. Uh, they immigrated here as political refugees from the uh, Vietnam War, and I was born and raised in the Midwest. And so growing up, I had to learn things quickly and at an early age, taking care of my siblings so my parents could focus on what they need to do as parents. My dad worked uh, close to 80 hours every week to support the family. Um, and my mom was a full-time mom at home. So 
I grew up very quickly, didn't really get to enjoy my childhood experience as much, but that's okay because, um, you know, all of those experiences really transformed me to be the person I am today. Um, you know, I grew up quickly and uh, was more mature than a lot of my peers. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the perspective I have in my life is that, you know, is one that's, I would say more mature than folks around my age. Um, for example, I have a show that talks about purpose and I'm in my mid thirties and I was just interviewing a guest last week and he was rather surprised by my passion and interest in this field of purpose and meaning. Um, a lot of folks around my age wouldn't engage in those deep and meaningful topics. They're more engaged in their, their other, other aspects of their life. And so, um, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit about who I am. <laughs> wow. Great. You know, we're going to have a great conversation now. You said you're one of 12 kids. Where do you fall? So uh, I fall towards the middle. Okay. So like seven, eight. Yes. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. So from the oldest to youngest, I'm like the, the, the seventh, I'd say. Okay. 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 Very interesting because we have similar backgrounds. And I think we talked about this on your show. I'm from the Midwest as well. I had a, a, a pretty challenging upbringing. Um, but what I want to get into with you is you spent 10 years in HR. Now you work with diversity and inclusion and some of those big companies helping them. And in today's day and age and everything that we have seen, you know, throughout 2020 to now, and with you being an Asian male, how do you feel about that? Yeah. So it's for me, I believe it's sort of a double-edged sword, right? Like generally speaking, speaking when society perceive Asian people, they're usually successful, educated, and well-mannered. That's just the the generalization, right? And then, of course, when you look at other ethnic, racial, or ethnic groups uh, compared to Asian Americans in the workplace, um, there seems to be a some disparities there. And... Um, and so when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, we have to define what that is for every organization and even every individual, because that's important to generate the type of work and product and, uh, and, and, and information that will either um, get your clients or your customers to buy the types of things you, you develop. And so... Um, you know, for me, for example, I not only identify as an Asian American, but also someone who happens to be gay and out. And so I have these identities that, um, you know, that makes up who I am, you know, in, in how I perceive uh, things in, in my life. And so there is this notion, and I did a thesis on this during my undergrad years, um, of the model minority myth, which is the concept of that Asians are considered the model minority and therefore every other racial group should copy that because they are the, the model. But the, the myth of it is that, um, you know, not, of course, not all Asians are, or you can't just generalize an entire group of people, right? Like, for example, my parents were political refugees of the Vietnam War. They grew they grew up in a third world country, had to fl fled to the United States, and they spoke no English, had no understanding of what America uh, was, didn't even know how to operate uh, a stove or a refrigerator. And so they had to start from the ground up in a world that they didn't know exist. And so growing up, I didn't, English wasn't my first language. I didn't, you know, like I wasn't born to, to learn how to speak English. Like I, I learned that in school. 
And, you know, and then of course going to, to, to school, going to, to obtain my, my, um, her ed degrees, I had to navigate all of those, those complexities of education and the systems within it and the processes and net and connect with the, you know, the right people to, um, essentially in order to, to pursue my education and graduate. So, you know, I would be considered as the first generation of my family go to college. That's, um, that's, um, the term that would be used for folks, you know, of my background. And so, so it's a challenge and, um, you know, I, I, so you factor a portion of, uh, you know, an, an ethnic group within the Asian population, like it's, it, 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 then challenges this notion that, well, are Asian Americans really are the model, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, because everyone's so different. I mean, of course, I believe in working hard. I believe in um, in excellence, doing the best I can in my work with what, you know, you know God or the, cre- the creator uh, has given me my abilities and talents to do the best work that I can. And so, you know, I, and I think everyone and sh- everyone should, but we shouldn't lump um, an entire group of uh, a racial group together and say, this is what they look like. And this is what they do. This is how they behave. So therefore everyone else should copy that. And I, I believe that it's quite frankly, a, a concept that was developed by um uh, you know, white supremacy. I mean, in order to uh, create this racial hierarchy, you have to have um, a model to look up to. So white people are on the top, Asians are in the below, and then of course, X, Y, Z, right? And so it's, uh, it's, it's of course, damaging to um, everyone, really, because if, for example... If, if, if I were an Asian American and, and uh, I'm sorry, if I were, uh, if I had a friend who was uh, African American and, and he perceives me as an uh, Asian American who is very well established in his career and in, in life, and he has this perception that, um, you know, all black people, all Native Americans, all Latinos should should behave and look and and be, you know, in that way the Asian Americans are. Then, then it's going to create some racial tension, of course, you know, between groups, and that's what the 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 institutional, um, you know, this the, the, that's what white supremacy. Um, that's how they operate. It is to generate animosity between racial groups. So that way, white people can remain um, being at the top. And so there's a lot of research out there that that talks about the model minority myth that I would encourage people to take a look at, um, because it is important to understand race relations um, as, as an ongoing challenge among, um, you know, relationships, friendships, you know, um, you know, within organizations, your coworkers. Um, so yeah, that's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, topic for sure. Yeah. I, I can hear the passion in your voice and just how you were able to articulate and, and expound on that makes me really feel it. it it's kind of, you're expressing some of the things that I have felt all my life mm-hmm. and I'm just wondering, because of your passion that you have and because of what you've been through in life, is that one of the reasons why you decided to get into diversity and inclusion? Yeah, that's a great question. So diversity, equity, inclusion is embedded within my DNA, right? I mean, obviously, I identify as an Asian American. That's pretty obvious. Um, And the experiences that uh, came, you know, out of my identities, um, have really shaped me to be the person I am today. And so, um, you know, I would be 
it would be a shame to say that I have never been discriminated and faced discrimination before. I have multi, a, a number of times. In fact, um, not only have I witnessed, um, you know, my parents being discriminated against when they first settled in America, um, it, you know, I was it was was threatened in, in a number of cases uh, because of my, um, you know, my look, um, and also in, in situations where um, people knew I was gay. And so um, it, it can be scary. And so I want to be able to engage in this work so that I can change people's hearts and minds um, so that we can live in a world of peace, a world of understanding, compassion, and love towards one another. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. And that's, what we need, we need more humanity in just uh, totally in America, but in the world in general. And we were speaking before we went live about how you're very mature. You, you have interest in things and have passion for purpose and the diversity and inclusion Um, that some might say that maybe other people in your age group are not focused on. So, it just it's just very interesting to me your perspective because not a lot of many people not many people get it right mm-hmm. um my perspective is different than a white woman's perspective mm-hmm. let's just say that and when you try to explain these things to certain people you know they go well oh no that's that's not real you know you and everyone else has the same opportunity but you and i both know that's not so mm-hmm. You know, we, they say, yeah, everybody has the same opportunity. Yeah, in quotes, that's true. But then there's things that you have and I have experienced and gone through that someone else will never go through. Mm-hmm. So when you're working with businesses and individuals and different clients of yours, when you're going through that process, tell me what that looks like. How, mm-hmm. when they bring you in, and you sit them down and you say, okay, you have this problem or you ask what is their problem and you start to go into your process with them. Tell me what that looks like and how are they reacting? Are they receptive? Are they um, saying, no, everything is great here? Because at the end of the day, we all want to think that we're on the right path. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that it's important to come into an organization and assess their their business challenges and needs and find sol- sol- the p- appropriate solutions to address those those challenges. So when I meet with a client or, or a prospect, what I usually do is ask them a list of questions around diversity, equity, inclusion, right? Like, how do you define diversity, equity, inclusion? How does it show up in the organization? What does it look like? And what are the challenges that you're currently facing at the moment and how does that tie into your um, five, 10 year business strategy plan? And so um, with every organization, it's different because of of either the the makeup of the organization or the size of the organization or the location, the geography of the location. So for example, in the Midwest organizations, are still struggling with, they get diversity, but they're still struggling with the notion of inclusion. Whereas in the the West Coast, particularly in the the Bay Area, organizations are, we get diversity, we get inclusion, we get equity. Let's talk about belonging. Belonging is like essentially the next step uh, towards achieving a, a, a workforce that is completely and absolutely engaged. And so, it's every again. Every organization is different, and you have to have a set of right questions to ask in order to properly diagnose, um, you know, the challenges that they face. Um, but going back to the definitions of diversity, equity, inclusion, I I know that there's a broad range of you know, a broad definition of each um, term, but I want to give an example so that that way actually helps your listeners to conceptualize um, it probably easier on what each of those terms means. So diversity is how I look at it is 
when you're at a meeting, you've been invited to the meeting, right? And there's a makeup of um, you know folks from different backgrounds in in race and gender. The inclusion part is um, even if you're invited to the table, the meeting, are you included in these discussions? Are you is you know when you're sharing your 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 thoughts and you're questioning. Um, things during the meeting are they perceived to be valid? Valid? Um, do you feel like you're, you're being respected? So that's the inclusion part. The equity part is it, it goes a step further and says let's look at the the process in which people were invited to the meeting and how they were treated during the meeting. And let's ensure that they have a space where they can actually share their thoughts and ideas without being judged because of the color of their skin or being stereotyped because of who they are. And so when you create a culture of belonging, you're really um, essentially creating an environment where people feel psychologically safe. There's this term of psychological safety where you're creating an environment of psychological safety, where people can actually share their ideas and, and opinions and, 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 and feel like they're not gonna get judged for it. And they're, it's authentic, it's 100% who they are and how they feel and what they think. And of course, there'll be disagreement, but those disagreements are not based on uh, because of the color of their skin, because they would have already um, the, the the company would have already um, created um, and implemented initiatives and programs to um, ensure that um, moments of being judged because of the color of your skin wouldn't happen in the workplace. And so um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does, you know, and I'm really glad you went into that because we hear that term, a lot nowadays, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. We hear it, and I don't think a lot of people actually know what that means. I think when you bring that up, people say, oh, well, we have, you know, Black people who work for us. We have Latinas. We have Asian people. But it's more than just checking the box saying that you hired mm -hmm. people of a certain persuasion. It's mm -hmm. more than that. And, it, it, and you hit it, the nail right on the head because – um, I don't know if you've heard of Cynthia Marshall, but I heard her speak a couple of years ago. She's the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. Mark Cuban hired her. Mm -hmm. She is the first woman and she's a black female. Mm -hmm. And in her talk that I heard her give, she was talking about diversity and inclusion. And she stated it like this, similar to yours. She said, um, diversity is being invited to a party. Mm -hmm. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she was a, a VP at AT&T for many years. And she said she would do this exercise with all of her execs in meetings and they couldn't get it because just like you and I are talking, mm -hmm. people, you say diversity and inclusion, but if you have never been that person on the other side, you don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. So she said in her meetings with execs, what she would do is she would just put on music and say, okay, how many people know how to do the Cupid shuffle. So the people who knew how to do it, we get up and dance. And then inevitably there's somebody who doesn't, right? So they're standing, looking around and, <laughs> you know, and everybody's having fun and dancing. And she goes, okay, so whoever's on the wall, people who, are, who know this dance, get somebody on the wall and teach them how to do this dance. Mm -hmm. So after her few minutes of doing this, she said, okay, that's diversity and inclusion. So the people who didn't know how to do this dance while you were standing on the wall and watching everyone else have fun, how did you feel? And then, of course, they said, well, I felt left out. I didn't feel right because I was the only one that didn't know how to do it. So exactly. So that's how people feel when, like you said, when you're invited to a meeting, but you're disregarded, you're not listened to. Um, what you have to say is not taken as valid. Mm -hmm. And I think people companies as a whole, I think they really need to go through a course or have someone like you to really teach them what it means. Because right now, I think it's just 
the buzzword of, of the of the century, right? Is mm. diversity and inclusion. Whereas I don't know if many people are really digging in to really say, okay, let's look at our diversity and inclusion and see if it's really what it is. Mm-hmm. Right. And the thing is, is that people are intimidated by this work because this work is hard and there's no single answer to an organizational challenge or challenges. And so it requires the participation of everyone within the organization from uh, individual contributors to, um, you know, executives. And so it's important that when we're doing this cultural transformation or change management, that we not only get the buy-in of the leadership team, but also that the mid-level leaders, uh, like the, you know, and the managers, for example, are behaving in ways that could really change the culture because they're essentially at the end of the day are mic- mimicking what the the executives are desiring, what needs to be changed. And they manage, these managers manage their teams. And so it's important that when it comes to behavior change and sustainability, that not only are we checking the box by providing one, two day unconscious bias training for everyone, or that, you know, when every new hire is hired on that they go through this unconscious bias training, but that there's a follow up discussion with their managers and that there's concrete steps that should be taken, um, you know, three to six months to a year so that the work continues and sustains. And so, you know, five, 10 years ago, when I was engaged in this work, it was essentially a a part-time job in addition to my full-time job. So what I mean by that is I would be hired as a full-time employee um, focusing on HR related matters. Um, but then, you know, my, my, the, the, the leadership t- team will pull me in and say, well, could we have you, you know, focus on this other aspect of our organization, but we won't compensate you for it. We want you to do it. So, um, but now I'm seeing the organization begin to change that. It's not, it's no longer a, a volunteer thing, right? And volunteer in a way, meaning that you're contributing, you know, a, additional time in, in, in work that's, you know, out of scope of your responsibilities. Now they're actually, um, you know, leaders uh, of organizations are now taking more accountability and action by delegating budgets to hire their chief diversity officer to, um, you know, allocate some, some, some budget for employee resource groups or affinity groups uh, doing these types of work. Um, employee resource groups, for example, um, leaders who lead those groups, not only are they leading them and managing their organization, they're also doing the daytime full-time job. And so um, in the past, they, the traditional round has, has always been, well, you're a nominator selected to, to serve as an ERG leader. Um, but then, um, you know, organizations will not compensate for you. And so it's, um, it's, it's in a way it's lacking, you know, the, the equity piece, right? Like when we talk about equity and, and, and what does that mean? Um, in order to retain top talent and people who are very compassionate about, um, you know, people who have passion in this work and are the most engaged employees of the organization, um, you have to ensure that um, they're happy. And part of it is that they should be compensated for, for extra work. Um, and so um, organizations... Uh, out here, especially in the Bay Area and West Coast, are beginning to realize just how important uh, this work is, and that um, if they were to be in the next Google or Facebook or Airbnb or the, one of the most innovative companies, that they have to retain um, a pool of diverse talent. Because research has indicated that organizations that have inclusive teams and diverse teams um, will outperform. Um, their competitors and you know diversity and thought in in in, in leadership and experiences and background um, 
definitely contributes to the creativity of, of work. And so, you know, that leads to innovation, which leads to higher profit margins for organizations. And so uh, one of the, the organizations, some of the, you know, some organizations that I've worked with, they, they tend to, they understand the research is there, that it's important and it's valid. But again, they're faced with the, the, the dilemma of how, of how do I um, change my behavior or get to understand this fully so that way my business can survive. And so a lot of it has to do with internal workings. Like we have to evaluate our own unconscious bias because everyone has biases. And so you have to do the internal work of assessing your, your biases um, and how that impacts, um, you know, your day-to-day uh, work and in, in the business and, and how you're going about recruiting uh, people, with diverse talent um, and, and sustaining diverse talent. Um, to ensuring that you're creating an organization that's um, not only inclusive, but is innovative and can be sustainable. Mm. So good. I mean, I I see why this is your passion. (laughs) Companies bring you in because it is, it's very important and you're so knowledgeable on it. We're going to shift gears and I want you to talk about your podcast because I think that's something that is uh, a part of you mm-hmm. and that is very valuable to talk about. So talk about that and why you decide to do it and just tell the listeners about it because I, I, I'm, I really like it. I really like what you're doing with it. Yeah. So, so the, my podcast uh, is, is titled the purpose to podcast and I got this idea because uh, off of a conversation I had with a friend who was struggling to find his passion in life and struggling with a lack of direction and with his career and personal life. And so he had a, a very high level of depression and anxiety and stress. And I've never seen him this way, known him for quite some time. And so I was thinking that maybe if I could create content around purpose and and meaning, that maybe perhaps I can help him um, find his own purpose in life. And also to those folks that are in the similar boat. And so it's really an idea that I had that stemmed from giving back to the people I know and love in you know, my friends and family and to the world. Um, you know, I've been volunteering since when I was, what, 14 in the communities, feeding the poor and um, providing clothes for, for the uh, homeless uh, people. And so the, the idea of giving back has always been um, a part of who I am. And so um It gives me light. It gives me joy to be able to produce content that's relevant, that could be uh, beneficial uh, for people and that can really hopefully change them for the better um, so that it can lessen their anxiety, depression, stress, and really get them to engage in what purpose means to them. Why they, why did, why do they exist? Like everyone has a purpose. We just have to tap into it. Um, And we have to have the right uh, tools, the right resources, the right people, mentors to guide us through. Um, and um, hopefully um, my, you know, I, I'll just put a, a, a slight dent to changing the world, but if I could do just that, I, I'd be very happy with with it. I love that. And I love the fact that you created a podcast and your friend inspired you and you wanted to do something to inspire him. Mm-hmm. So how is your friend, how, once you get this off the ground and rolling, what did he think about it? Yeah, that's a good question. So he loves it. I mean, he follows every, every episode that I produce and, you know, every once in a while he'll send me a text message saying, Hey, I like, I like this idea. What do you think of that idea? Or, um, you know, so we bounce back in, in um, have a genuine conversation about what life means to us, to each of us. And so, um, you know, he's no longer, um, you know, in that state of depression, um, and you know, he's beginning to realize 
uh, that, you know, of course, life, there's, there's greater things than what he's dealing with. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of encouragement there for him and um, capacity for him to grow as a human being to hopefully achieve um, uh, his own um, purpose. And so just to be able to see him on this path or journey to um, to find his own um, uh, purpose makes me very happy because it means that I in some way changed his life uh, and his perception um, of um, you know what he thinks about himself and and that's 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 good me I think <laughs> oh yeah no that's great I mean we all want that type of friend right especially when we're in those dark moments we want someone that will relate to us and talk to us and not condemn us or judge us or tell us oh snap out of it you know you're stupid because it's not that easy mm -hmm. And when somebody's really in a dark time, they don't need you punching them while they're down. You know, they need you to really be there for them if they need that inspiration or a shoulder to cry on. But ultimately, they need someone to tell them, OK, don't give up. There's there's more for you in the future. So you want to keep going. So I think that's great that you inspired your friend and that he's doing well and that he's yeah. listening and he's he's commenting on your shows. I mean, to me, that's. That's the ultimate act of service. And that's something that you actually got to see and reap the reward from. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and, you know, just to step back a little too, I didn't get a chance to share what the, the goal of the show uh, is, but it's really to create valuable content for my listeners um, so that they can incorporate the content in their own lives to make an impact, drive meaning and achieve fulfillment. And so if I could do that on a broad scale, I think that, um, it would be such an opportunity to be of service to to people and to this world. And when I think about purpose, I think about about service. I think about giving back. And it doesn't have to be um, you know donations in the form of money, but um, you know it could be your time, your wisdom, your knowledge. And so there are many ways of giving back. Um, and if everyone can do their part in giving back, I think that we would uh, create a, a better world, a world where people can be purpose-driven and could be um, you know, satisfied with and content with their, their life. And so um, you know, I think that we need more of these types of discussions um, in order to get people to really be in the present moment and really think about what is the meaning of my life? Like, why do I exist? Like, why did the creator created me? You know, whatever your creator is. Um, and if you don't have one, that's fine too. But I, I solely believe that everyone was created and meant to be here and they have a mission that they had to accomplish before they're gone. And so I do not want people to leave this earth without having to accomplish everything that they need to accomplish that's set forth for them to tap into the potential and reach the highest um you know talents and abilities and to give back to the world everyone has something to give back um and everyone is unique in their own way and so we have to um you know inspire people to be able to uh get them to be in a place that's not only authentic, but that they're um, believing in themselves and that they know that they're a gift to the world. Mm. You just make me smile. I'm just sitting here while you're talking <laughs> and I'm just smiling because it's just so refreshing. It's great to hear someone who is positive and trying to be positive in the world because we have so much negativity and so much chatter going on that mm. Some days it can look very bleak and you, you wonder what's going on. You're like, okay, is the world coming to the end or what's going on here? So it's very refreshing to hear someone who has a passion for helping people find their purpose and being positive. Mm -hmm. So I am going to just go into our rapid fire questions. So buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> All right. Let me just... <laughs> Yeah. Strap in. If you need oxygen, you know, get your mask. <laughs> okay. So who or what 
motivates you? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I would say my mom. The reason why is because she, so she's this four, uh, four foot, what, eight, nine a woman who can be feisty. Um, and she, you know, she's been such an incredible mom to us 12 kids. Um, just imagine you have kids, right? Just imagine giving yes. birth to 12 kids and having to raise them all. Um, that's a remarkable woman. Um, and she, I'm proud of her. Um, you know, my education is dedicated to, and my commitment to my career is dedicated to her. Um, I love her. She's amazing. Um, and, um, I think that, you know, everyone should have a, a, a positive relationship with their, with their, uh, mom or dad, if they have one, because, um, even if they agree or disagree, because there's a lot of life lessons that can be learned. Um, you know, I know people who don't get along with their parents because they want their parents to act one way or another. And so, um, what we need in this world is, um, understanding and compassion. And so, uh, my dad, for example, I'm not really close with him, but, um, he, you know, and I don't necessarily agree with everything he says or do, but I can, I get it. Like, I understand why he would, um, either behave or, or perceive um, certain things uh, that he does. Um, and I, I don't want to change him because, you know, he wouldn't be happy, you know, uh, being a person that's completely different. And I wouldn't be happy either because he wouldn't be happy. And so um, I've learned to just um, have compassion, understanding, and as hard, it, 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 as easy as it says, it's really hard to do but I incorporate them to my practice in all of my relationships. Wow. And I do have to say your mom is an amazing woman to have 12 children or raise them. I have two and it takes my best <laughs> to do it. <laughs> but what you said was beautiful. And I, th I think speaking as a mom, that is more valuable than any gift that a child could give a mother is to say those words that you said. So um, your mom has got to be very proud of you. And I think that was a, a beautiful thing that you said. And if you haven't told your mother, you need to tell her. That. <laughs> I do. I do. She knows that. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. What demotivates you? What demotivates me? Wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think that it's been a rough four years of having, um, Trump in the White House. I think that it's been a lot of, there were days where I wake up um, anxious and um, not knowing the future of this country um, and where I lie be as a gay man um, and also as a person of color. Um, and so I, you know, I don't want to get into politics, but I do not want to engage with people who are just completely toxic and negative. Um, and does not have any uh, sense of humanity in them or decency um, because it doesn't go anywhere. The conversation is not productive. Um, of course, you can implement it like the whole, like, you know, Stephen Covey, like the seven habits, right? Like, you know, seek first and understand, but how could you do that uh, on the other aisle if, if they look at you as an enemy and just because of who you are, not because that's a human, they don't even look at you as a human. They look at you as just, um, as nothing. And so um, it's hard. It's been really hard. So I'm very happy that uh, we now have a president that um, is inclusive and accepting of differences and, and loves um, people for their humanity um, and, and having decency. Um, and there's a lot of great Republicans out there that have that, but Trump is an, a different animal. And so and in, in the things that he's created out of his presidency has been, um, it's been such a, a divide for this country. And so I, I love America and, you know, I love, you know, uh, my fellow Americans and I want to be able to create, um, you know, hopefully a world uh, or at least contribute to a world where we can have more compassion and understanding and listening. Um, so, yeah. Okay. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked for your good? 
Oh, that's a great question. Like, I feel like I'm getting interviewed here for a job or something. <laughs> so, but to repeat the question one more time. So, what, what was explain a time when something has has hurt me? Okay, and, so here it yep. is. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, mm -hmm. but it worked out for your good? Yeah. Gee. Um, I mean, I, I suppose there's a lot of situations of that, but the the one that comes to my mind, I would say, um, you know, this is we're on this topic of diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace. Um, so I had applied for a position, um, in the hiring manager had asked me, you know, what makes you distinctive, unique, uh, and how and how can you leverage those those traits? Uh, to contribute to this position. And I said, well, as a person who happens to not only be, um, you know, a person of color, but also gay, I think I have um, many experiences that have shaped me to be who I am. And I think I have a unique perspective because of those identities that I can contribute to the to this role. And he said, what hurt me was, and to my surprise was, calm, you need to tone that down a bit. So what he was saying was, um, I don't like the fact that you're gay. I don't like the fact that you're an Asian American or person of color. And I want you to tone it down because um, I'm, I don't. I don't want to tolerate that. And so, um, so of course, I report him to the HR, and you know, we we you know we got him in and then talked about um, you know his comment and, and um, trained him in um, in understanding how that hurts and also provide him with some leadership uh, coaching so that it doesn't happen again. And so um, that, you know, he was, you know, a pretty a, a leader within the organization. He was pretty high up there. And so he has a, a division that he manages. And so um, it was, uh, uh, it was good to be able to, um, to say that it's not, it's not okay to be, you know, to, to treat people who are, uh, who may look and, and think different in, in that way. And you know, I didn't get the job. Um, and so, um, you know, that of course explains it all. Right. And so, uh, but, you know, I did, you know, provide him with the opportunity for, for coaching. Good for you. Mm -hmm. What is your fear? What is my fear? Wow. That's another great question. You know, so, I think fear is for me is the uncertainty. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and I don't know what lies ahead in terms of my career or the business I'm trying to launch. But at the same time, I'm not going to let fear um, hold me down. It's just uh, it, that's just part of life, right? Um, you either focus on it or you um, deal with it. And how I deal with it is, you know, I say, okay, I, I acknowledge that, you know, fear is there, but I'm going to take the chance to do it. I'm going to, you know, build up the courage to take the risk anyway um, out of fear because that's what, uh, you know, great leaders have done. That's what great entrepreneurs have done. People who have changed the world have walked in the face of fear. Martin Luther King Jr., for example, have done it. Um, and unfortunately, he, you know, uh, risked his life for it. But there's also, you know, other entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. And, you know, so there's a lot of incredible people out there that have dealt with it. It's just um, how do you handle it? That's, uh, that's the key. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a time when you wish you had done something that you didn't? Mm. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where you got these questions, but they're really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's probably more difficult in my, my job interviews, for sure. Um, <laughs> a lot of self-reflection, right? <laughs> um. You know, I would say 
So my, my dad has always instilled the importance of education um, in our family. And, um, you know, I, so I was in, it was towards the end of my, my master's program. And I, I told him that, um, you know, I wouldn't be graduating, even though I knew I was going to, but I, I wanted just to test him out. Uh, to see how he felt about it and just to tease him a little. Um, and he was, I couldn't, re- I, I could remember the, f- the face he gave me. He just gave me like a, a, a face that's like, are you kidding me type of face? Like, are you serious? Like, I've, you know, I, I've supported you all this time and this is why you're doing. <laughs> and that made me feel so bad as a son um, you know, and just for joking around, um, because he knew I was studying hard. He knew, uh, you know, I had long nights. There was a, a weekend program and I commute, uh, six hours, you know, um, total, um, there and back. And my, I have lost my weekends, you know, committed to my education and you know, how hard, uh, hard, how hard it was for me, you know, the commitment that I had to make. And so, um, and I wish I could take that back because uh, that didn't sit, sit well. And I still have this image that, that, that uh, you know, haunts me, you know, of him. And that's not something that I want, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there a time that you wish you had not done something? I guess that's, that's kind of cumbersome. We'll skip that question. Okay. I think you can answer that with this one. What is your definition of success? Mm, that's a great question. So my definition of success is is achieving um, not just your financial goals, but your personal goals and your relationship goals um, and your life goals. Um, and to be able to maximize my, my fullest potential um, abilities and talents and having no regrets. I know a lot of people out there that have achieved financial success, but are just completely uh, miserable because they don't either have the, the, the right relationships, they neglected their wives or their spouse, uh, their kids, or um, you know they haven't found purpose. And they thought that maybe perhaps money could take care of it all. And that it was the answer to everything. And so we have to ensure that we have this holistic uh, view of what success is. And it's not just about building a business and, and, and filing for an IPO and having it you know, sustained or um, achieving wealth. It's more than that. It's about the quality of our relationships with our loved ones. It's about um, you know having a purpose that guides us towards our North Star. It's about evolving uh, as a human being and learning. Um, you, you know, I consider myself as a continuous learner and I will learn until the day I die. And because there's just so much uh, knowledge out there. And, 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 and so the, you know, we live in an age, age of digital information. We can, you know, get information so quickly. And so thank God to technology, at the same time, um, you know, if we're going to achieve success, we have to uh, ensure that we're not ne- neglecting other areas of, of our lives. How do you recharge? I recharge through exercising and meditating. I work out five times a week at the gym. I do some cardio exercises, some weightlifting um, and then every morning I set, uh, you know, five minutes just to meditate, to set the tone for the day. And that really helps me. Hmm. What legacy do you want to leave? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> again, it, like all of these questions ties into purpose, right? Like what is your legacy? Um, how can you be a better human being? So, you know, I, I like to... I like to leave a legacy that's bigger than myself where when I do have kids that they will benefit from it and that they will say, look, 
um, this is our, our dad. And this is the, this is how he lived his life. You know, someone who is, um, you know, who, who's compassionate, kind to people and, um, and always wants to create a better world, um, to be able to have, um, you know, inspiration for others to be, um, them, their better self. I think that, uh, in the space of personal and professional development, it's important to lift each other higher uh, so that we can create a world where um, people can um, have um, whatever they want, uh, achieve happiness and success in whichever version that is for them. And to be able to do it in a way that is equitable, um, that is um you know, fear that is, um, you know, in a way that's respectable. Give the listeners one motivational takeaway. Motivation. <laughs> I would say, I would tie it back to uh, purpose. I would say, if you don't know what your purpose is, dedicate some time to it by either doing some research on the subject or write down a purpose statement and have that guide, have that as a guide to your life. What research finds or have found is that uh, people who are, pur- who are purpose driven, who have a purpose, live longer. They have lower levels of stress and anxiety and depression and the quality of their relationships with other people and with themselves are so much, it's better uh, than those that don't have a purpose or or a direction. So that's my advice. Mm. So Kong, as we wrap up, tell the listeners how they can connect with you. If they want to hire you, Mm -hmm for a coach, um, how they can listen to your podcast and any other things that you have going on. Yeah. So I'm in the middle of creating a website. Um, it's not up yet, but when I do, I'll post it on LinkedIn. I am on LinkedIn. Um, you know, my, my first name is Kong. Last name is Shong. First name is spelled K H O N G. Last name is X as an X-ray I O N G. And they find me on LinkedIn, uh, on Facebook, um, I also, of course, have um, the podcast, the Purpose Tune podcast that they can um, subscribe on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Radio Public, and other outlets. Great. Well, Kong, I thank you for your time. And this just purpose-driven conversation has been great. So Thank you for being on Trina Talk. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, thanks for giving me this opportunity to to speak more about uh, you know my show and 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 hopefully inspire people to um, not only tap into their own purpose, but also live a fulfilling and meaningful life. If you like Trina Talk podcast, please don't forget to go out to iTunes and rate it five stars and leave a review. Also, who else in your life do you know that needs some motivation and inspiration in their life? Don't forget to share Trina Talk with them. I hope you have a great week. And remember, if you change your mindset, you can change your life. Keep striving because success is a journey, not a destination.